Well, good. Grab your Bibles and uh, turn to Hebrews chapter number one. But before you do that, we are going to do our memory verse. And you thought I forgot. I did. And so now we're going to go back to it and do it here. Uh, Matthew 4.19. All right, say it with me. Matthew 4.19. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 4.19. Good job. I think, I think we'll be able to say it here next week without the screens. We should, should do it with no screen and uh, no help. All right, turn your Bibles. Hebrews chapter number 1. And uh, brother, uh, when we were shaking hands, I went to brother Jimmy and he told me, he said, I didn't know pastor wasn't going to be here. I'm, I'm going to leave now. And I was like, oh, okay. I told him, I said, when pastor's on vacation, we're all on vacation. And so we're uh, having a good time. Before he left, he gave me a, a paper with a bunch of things that he wanted me to do next week. And I told him, I was like, yeah, man, this is all going to be done by Monday. I'm, like, I'm going to be set to go for the rest of the week. And so, no, I'm kidding. Hebrews chapter number one. And um, we're going to look at something this morning that I hope is... A blessing to you. I hope it'll help you. Uh, I'll say this, you're probably not going to learn anything new this morning, but we are definitely going to look at some things that uh, are important, and I hope that it's a reminder to you. Uh, sometimes it's not really learning new things, it's just relearning old things. Um, and how many know it's true that you just, uh, you really, I mean, here and there you learn some new things, but in life, it's really just about relearning old things, and they have kind of get more deeper, and you kind of understand things. Um, your, your, your knowledge doesn't really, and some of you know this better than I do, uh, your knowledge doesn't really uh, get more wide, it gets deeper. And, and, you, and you relearn things, and uh, that's what we're going to do this morning, is we're going to relearn some things. Uh, we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to learn some basic fundamental truths that are found here within the Word of God. And I hope it's a blessing and I hope it's a help to you. Sometimes we can overcomplicate some things, can't we? Uh, we get to a point where we, we overcomplicate it. And uh, it really, if you just get back to, to the basics, you start to relearn some things. I have just recently gotten to golf. And, I, and I, I'm like, I'm really into it. Like I, I went out, I think about like a week and a half ago and I was on the third hole or the second or third hole. And I looked at the guy cause I, for years I just, I, you know, I made fun of people who played golf and I was like, yeah, it's not fun. It's boring. You know, who likes to, but I went out and I was like on the third hole and I looked at the guy I was with and I was like, I oh, mean, I get it. I get it now. You know, when you hit the ball and it lands right on the green, you're like, man, yep, I get it now. And so, but as I, as I, I like to learn things and I like to, I like to do it quickly. Like, I'm like, I, I want to know how to do this, and I want to know how to do it right now. And so as I'm learning how to golf, uh, I have, I've had people give me tips. And so I'm trying to apply all these tips and trying to do all these things. And I have to, I have to face this way and look this way and hit the ball this way. And, and, and sometimes the, all that information is, like, so overwhelming that it, you, have to, you have to say, man, I just need to get back to my goal is to hit the ball. It, you know, and you can get wrapped up with all these different things of how, how you can do this and how you can do that. And sometimes you just need to get back to, I just need to let it naturally happen and, and just, and just, and just the simplicity of it. And so we're going to learn, we're going to, not going to learn, we're going to relearn some simple basic things here in the Bible as we get into Hebrews chapter number one. And before we read, uh, I'd like to pray. Uh, we need God this morning, and, and not just this morning, but we need God at all times. Um, uh, it's by Him that we live and breathe and have our being. And uh, I think it'd be appropriate every now and then to kind of pause and give Him some glory for it. And I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful for who He is and what He's done. Um, and so we're going to pray. We're going to give some uh, emphasis to God. And we're going to go to Him and ask Him to help us as we open the Bible. Lord, we love you. And God... We worship you as God. Lord, you're the only God. There is none else. Uh, there's no one else beside you, God. Uh, Lord, we know that you are. We know that you have always been and that you always will be. God, we're thankful for you and we're thankful for your power and your might, God. Lord, we stand in awe before you tonight, uh, this morning, uh, as we think about who you are as, uh, as our God and God, uh, like Job said, we know that you can do everything. And so, God, as we come to you this morning, we ask, for, uh, we ask for your power. And, God, we ask for understanding in your word so that we can understand you better. 
Uh, God, we ask that you would reveal some things in the Bible uh, so that we might learn who you are and we might uh, uh, deepen our understanding of who you are, God. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us use your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, God, so that we might grow and so that we might be the Christians that you want us to be, God. And I pray all these things in your wonderful name. Amen. As we get to Hebrews chapter number one, uh, there's some interesting things about this book. Uh, Hebrews is a very uh, scholastic, academic book. It's very, uh, it's very wise in, in, in the way that it's written. And we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so uh, Hebrews is given by God. But as far as the human author, uh, it is unknown who penned the, the book of Hebrews. People have their uh, guesses and people can say who they think it is. But really at the end of the day, again, we understand that it's not about the human author, but rather about God, the, 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 the author who, who, who inspired this book to be. And so uh, fun fact for you, as we begin in Hebrews chapter number one, uh, it is the only book in the Bible that starts off with God. The first word is God. Look at Hebrews chapter number one, verse number one. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And we're going to stop right there. I, I, I want to uh, preach this morning on, and here's the title of my sermon, is the progressive revelation of God until his Son. And bear with me here, I know that seems kind of like a mouthful, but bear with me here, it's a lot simpler than you think. Uh, God has a message for all mankind, and uh, it's important to understand who God is. A lot of us, uh, a lot of people in the world have a misunderstanding of who God is. They don't understand who He is, because if they did understand who He is, they would be in church this morning. They would say, I want to know who God is. Uh, and so a lot of us, and, and I think sometimes it even creeps into the church sometimes, we get a misunderstanding of who God is based on what the world tells us who God is. Uh, there's only one book that can tell us who God is, and that's the Bible. Uh, there is no other way to find out who God is. Uh, he reveals himself, we know, through creation, uh, but we understand that that is a general revelation, and we can look outside and know for sure that there is a God. Uh, anywhere in the world you'll go and you'll find that there are people everywhere worshiping a God. Why? Because it, 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 is, a, it, is, a, um, it is a natural inclination of man to worship something higher than himself. And we know that to be the case in Revelation chapter number 4. The Bible says that all things were created for the mere pleasure of God. And I ought not to say mere pleasure, but the, rather the pleasure of God. We've all been created to worship God. And mankind knows this. This is a natural inclination of man, is to worship a God. And we can know who the God that we're supposed to worship, who, who that is, based on what the Bible says about him. And so as we approach the Bible this morning, let's find out who God is. And let's find out what he has done for us and how he has revealed himself to us so that we can know who he is and in turn better worship him. And so as we get to Hebrews chapter number one, we, we understand that it starts off with God. Now, who is God? The Bible, at, 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 at the very beginning stages of the Bible, in Genesis chapter number 1, and verse number 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so there's this, there's this assumption, the Bible makes this assumption that we all understand and know that there is a God. It never says that this is where God came from, and it never says that this is how God was formed. It never says uh, anything about the creation of God. It just says, in the beginning, God. And it gives no explanation as to who he is, or, or what he has done, or I'm sorry, or how we ought to know him. It just tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The thing that sets God apart from every other being in, in, in the universe is that God is the creator and everything else has been created. And that's what sets God apart from everybody else, is that, that we are not on the level of God. Why? Because we are not creator. Matter cannot be made or destroyed. It can only be formed. But God has created matter. It says in Genesis 1-1 that God spoke and it was. And the, the mere power that is in his voice. So there's assumptions that are made about God that can't really explain or we can't really explain away and we can't really truly understand sometimes but we really just have to believe it by faith 
we have to say, you know, I believe that the, the worlds were framed by the, world, uh, by the word of God. And Hebrews uh, chapter, chapter 11, it, it tells us that by, we just need to believe it by faith. And so there's certain assumptions that are made in Genesis chapter number 1. And we, we, we want to know who God is. And here we can understand who God is. Uh, the Bible, uh, we, we know that uh, there was a time in world history where God came down to earth and had fellowship with man on earth. Uh, we know that to be the case. If uh, Go back to Genesis and we'll look. We're going to do almost a quick synopsis of the entire Bible this morning. And uh, we're going to run through it. And we're going to uh, step by step look at God revealing himself to man all the way up until his son, Jesus Christ. And so look at uh, in Genesis chapter number three. In verse number eight, the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And so... Uh, here in, in, in Genesis chapter number 3, we have to automatically assume that God is dealing with man in a completely different way than he is right now. Uh, I, I, I think it's safe to assume that each and every single one of us did not walk with God in the garden this morning. Physically, and I'm speaking physically, and you understand what I'm trying to say is that we, there is no way for us to have a, a, a literal relationship with God in that we can walk with Him and communicate with Him and, and understand who He is and have that relationship that we are we can have with one another. That that it does not happen. But here in Genesis chapter number three, we see that God came and it says that He was walking in the garden. And so understand that, that this is a completely different time from right now. And, and it really doesn't explain much more than what's happening right here. Um, look at Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter number 4. And we have the story of Cain and Abel. And, 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 and the, the, the synopsis of the story, the summary of the story really is uh, Cain and Abel were offering sacrifices to God. And Cain... It was Cain. It was Cain that uh, offered the wrong sacrifice and was upset about it. And so he killed his brother Abel. And look at Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 16. The Bible says, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And understand, go, go uh, let me see here. Go to verse number 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? So there's a very, uh, understand, again, and, and this needs to be uh, iterated and, and reiterated because we, we have this misconception where we believe God to be this, this, uh, this weird, vague, obscure being that we can't really know. But God, God desires for us to know who he is. And here in this, in this passage, God is revealing himself to Cain in a literal sense. Not in a weird, obscure voice from the sky. No, God has revealed himself to Cain, and he is talking to him. And none of us have ever talked to God face to face. And yet here's Cain, and he's talking to God, and God says, where's your brother? And, Cain, and, and remember, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And, and then understand, in verse 16, it says that Cain left the presence of the Lord. So, so, there's this time where Cain was in the presence of the Lord, and I believe that's literal, and that he was literally in the presence of the Lord, as uh, in the same way that I'm in the presence, and you are in the presence of each other this morning, that Cain was literally in the presence of God, and he chose to leave it. He chose to break off fellowship with God. And so, uh, go to Genesis chapter number 5, and verse number 24. The Bible says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so here we understand, again, there's another example of somebody, and, and I don't think this is metaphorical. I don't think this is, uh, we're supposed to take it uh, in, in, a, in a different sense, other than literally, Cain, uh, I'm sorry, Enoch walked with God. He had a relationship with God. He, he talked with him. He, he walked with him. He had a friendship with God. And, and, and where the Bible starts to get interesting is as you get to Genesis chapter number 6. And verse number 3, the Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. 
And so you have six chapters in the book of Genesis where God is is dealing with man one-on-one personally. He's communicating with them. He is making himself known to them. And here when it gets to chapter number six, and I think it's ironic that uh, as you... As you read chapter number six, you start to see that's where man really takes a turn for the worse. And at this point, God is starting to say, I'm not always going to have a relationship with man the way that that we have known it to be in the first six chapters. And God starts to take his hand and he starts to, to kind of step away from making himself known to mankind in a literal sense. As in he's, his voice is talking to them. And as you read on in your Bible, it, 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 is, it, it really is almost sad in a sense that you start to see God communicating to man one-on-one. It starts to, 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 to slowly go away. And, and we'll look at it here in a minute. Uh, but, but you'll see that, that God, may, it, it starts, there starts to be uh, more times where he just steps away and he doesn't make himself known to man. And I don't fault God for that. Uh, the Bible says that all the thoughts and intents of the heart of man was evil continually. And, and when the Bible speaks of God, it says that he is a righteous God, a holy God, a just God. And, and as mankind, mankind has never gotten any better. We have continually just seemed to have gotten worse and worse and worse. And we think to ourselves, we're getting better, but it really just seems to keep going downhill for mankind. And the more we try to fix our problems, the more problems we create with the solutions that we try and fix the problems with. Do you understand what I'm trying to say this morning is that mankind has not gotten any better. Oh, we might be cleaner. We might be uh, more advanced in our technology. We might be more advanced in the way that we do our jobs. And we might have a better lifestyle now. But as compared to our morality, man has only gotten worse. And God is slowly stepping away from the world. And he's saying, I don't want much to... And really, in a way, it seems like he's saying, I don't want much to do with that. Why? God is holy. He is just. And man, mankind is the very opposite of that. We're sinful. We have problems. And I don't, I, don't need to, I don't need to belabor that point. We all understand that we are sinful. Mankind has a problem. We have a sin problem. And God has nothing to do with it. Uh, I had my... I, uh, a friend called me yesterday and he told me he was trying to witness to somebody and he said the, this man was, was so upset at God. He said, because if God really is, is good, then why are there so many evil things happening? And, and isn't that the question of the ages? Is, is, we're all asking, if God is so good, then why is there bad things that is happening? And, and, I, and, and you think about it, that's that misunderstanding of who God is. In Genesis chapter number one and verse in chapter number two, God made all things and he said it's very good. God created everything and it was very good. There was no problem, there was no blemish in what God created, and yet man willfully took a step away from God and said, I'm going to be rebellious. There's evil in this world, not because of who God is, but because of who man is. And our misunderstanding of God is, well, if God is so good, then why, did, why does he allow evil? Well, God is good, and he gives us a free will to choose. And we've chosen evil. We've all gone aside. We've all gone into our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We, there, there is none that seek after the Lord. And so, man is progressively getting worse, and God is progressively Stepping away and saying, I, can't, I cannot tarnish who I am for your sake. Now understand this, as we keep going on, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter number 1, it says God. And so, we have to have a basic understanding of who God is, and what He's done uh, uh, throughout. And we've looked already that God is the creator. He has, he has physically and, and literally made Himself known to people uh, by Himself. And, but as we continue to go on, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number one, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, um, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the, the word sundry there really just means different. In, in, in 
uh, the, the word, if you break it down, it really just means in various di- at various different uh, times. And so you have different times. The Bible says that God, who spake, he revealed himself. He made himself known to man at sundry times, at various different times, and in diverse manners. Meaning, in many different ways and in many different times, God has revealed himself to man for us to know who he is. And it says that he did that unto the fathers, speaking of the fathers of of Israel, Abraham, uh, Jacob, and Isaac, those are the fathers. He spake unto the fathers, and also any, any father after them, the whole generation of Israel. It says, he spake unto the fathers by the prophets. So God has revealed himself to uh, mankind. We get to a point in biblical history where God removes himself and begins to communicate to people through different means. Uh, understand that uh, here you have an approximate, as we go through and, and you look at, we all know the story of Noah and about how he makes an ark and God completely destroys mankind because of how sinful they are. And there is a dramatic change in the world after the flood. And there's a period of around 350 to 400 years between God speaking to Noah and the next father, which is Abraham. You have a period of four, almost 400 years where God, God does not make himself known to man in those 400 years. They have to go off what they already knew about God. Uh, Of course, that's a recorded instance of what we have in the Bible. And let's go to Genesis chapter number 12. In Genesis chapter number 11, there's the, the, the Tower of Babel, and that's an interesting study. You can go and look at that. That's a very interesting story. But God, uh, under, I'll, I'll read this verse to you really quick just so we, so we understand it. In, in, in Genesis chapter number 11, verse number 7, God, uh, verse number 6, uh, verse number 5. We'll just keep getting more Bible here. Uh, the, the Bible says in Genesis 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse number 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. So here you have, the Bible says that the Lord came down. Where did he come down from? The Bible says he's the high and lofty one. Right? He sits upon his throne in heaven. His habitation's not here on this earth, but it's rather in heaven. And the Bible says he came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And then notice, it's, it's, it's interesting that he says, go to let us go down there and confound their language and they, that they may not understand one another's speech. And I, I think it's a very interesting uh, portion of scripture is that God has this meeting with the Godhead and says, let's go down there and confuse them. And he did. He went down and confused the children of men and changed all their languages. And, 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 and so from that point on, and, and to verse number 12, I mean, chapter number 12, the Bible says, and, and this is the first recorded inst- uh, instance of God revealing himself to another man after Noah. And the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And so understand here that, that God is speaking, literally, his voice is being known to Abraham. That is what is implied when it comes to speaking. He is, he is making himself known to Abraham. And the Lord said unto Abram, uh, go unto a land. Now, we're going to, again, like I said, we're just going to do a quick overview. Go to Genesis chapter number 15. And this is where it gets interesting. And you start to progressively see God change in the way that he communicates with man. In Genesis chapter number 15, verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham Abraham, in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And so here's the first instance of God revealing himself to man, not in a voice, but rather in a vision, in a dream. In, in, in something different, rather than a one-on-one communication, God is revealing himself to a specific man in a vision. And that's, that, that's intriguing. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter number 1, it says, at various different times, I'm sorry, who at sundry times and in what? Diverse manners. 
And once again, you find the Bible is real, that the Bible is true when it says that God revealed himself in many different times and at many different ways. Not just one-on-one. God desires for you to know who he is, but he doesn't always reveal himself as an audible voice, but rather sometimes he reveals himself in different ways. And so... Bear with me here as we continue going on. Uh, Genesis, in Genesis chapter number 18 and Genesis chapter number 21, God reveals himself to Abram again, uh, once as uh, in the plains of Mamre, and two other men are there with Abram, or I'm sorry, with God, and God reveals himself to him. What's interesting is you get on to Isaac. So you have Abraham and all the... God revealing himself to Abraham. But as you get to Isaac, there's only one recorded instance of God revealing himself to Isaac. And in Genesis chapter number 26, and verse number 2, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, and dwell in the land which I shall tell of thee. And so, that's the only recorded instance of God revealing himself to Isaac, which I think is intriguing. Because you have so many instances of Abraham and God, and, and Abraham... It is, 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 I could be wrong on this. I'm pretty sure in the New Testament it calls him the friend of God. Or is that, that might be Moses. Brother Mark? Is that Abraham? Yes, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I thought it was. Uh, Abraham is called the friend of God. Why? He had a relationship. He was a friend of God. He, he, God had made himself known to him, but as you go on, in Isaac, there's only one instance of God revealing himself to Isaac. And when you get to Jacob, and that even gets more interesting, because Jacob, remember, we all know the story of Jacob, and, and, and the Bible says that he wrestled, he wrestled, the Bible actually says that he wrestled with a man all night long. It never says who the man is. It just says that he wrestled with this obscure character, but when Jacob wakes up, when he gets up in the morning, what does he call the place? He calls it Peniel, which is the face of God. Or I have seen God face to face. And isn't that interesting that here Jacob wrestles with God. And there's a a, a physical wrestling with the the God of the universe. I think that's interesting. You'll find that uh, Jacob is also, here's something interesting. We all think about the Jacob, Jacob's ladder. As Jacob is running away from his brother who's trying to kill him, he takes a nap, or he, takes, he goes, finds himself a, a, a stone and makes it his pillow, and he sleeps for the night, and God reveals himself to Jacob in a dream. And here's the dream. The dream is that Jacob sees a, a, a ladder going, the Bible says, go, um, that goes from heaven, to, or from earth to heaven, and what he sees is angels ascending ascending and descending, and here's what he sees at the very top, God. He sees God at the top. Now, I can't tell you what that means, but here's here's my guess. God says, from now on, angels are going to come up and down, and they're going to minister to you, and I'm no longer going to physically be here. I, I think that's what it could entail. I'm not dogmatic on that, so don't, don't, don't go off and run that with that. But, that's, but isn't it interesting that Jacob has revealed a dream where there's a, a, a ladder that's going from earth to heaven, and there's angels ascending and descending? And then from that point, you start to see angels appear to man more often than you saw it before? And so as you go on, you have Jacob. And then, and then think about Joseph. Do you know there's not a single instance in Joseph's life, where the Lord appears to him. He has a dream, but the the dream never says, it never says that God appeared to Joseph in a dream. It just says that Joseph had a dream. And we know that the dream uh, was prophetic in nature because we see it it being uh, fulfilled later on where his brothers were bowing down to him. But the Bible never says that God revealed that dream to Joseph. It just said that Joseph had the dream. And then we also know that while he was in prison, the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. But at this point, you, other than that, there is no instance of God revealing. It never says, and the Lord said unto Joseph. It never says, the Lord said unto Joseph in a dream. It never says that the Lord appeared unto Joseph. It just says that the Lord was with Joseph. 
And I think that's intriguing. As you go on, uh, in between the lives of Joseph and Moses, there's another 400 years where God does not speak or reveal himself in a, in, a, in a recorded instance. And you get to Moses, and you'll find that the children of Israel have been in bondage for years, and, and, and that doesn't, uh, uh, God doesn't reveal himself to the Israelites. Here's who he reveals himself to, a castaway man. A man who was exiled, a man who ran away from his people, a man who, who, was, who was distanced from his people, who was in the backside of a wilderness, and God appears to him, not, not in a voice, not as a being, but how? As a burning bush. God reveals himself to Moses. And Moses, I don't know if he's ever had an encounter with God before, but Moses takes off his, uh, the Bible, t- the God tells Moses to take off his shoes because where he's stepping is holy ground. And what you'll find is Moses is a very unique character in the Bible in that God reveals himself to Moses more than uh, any other uh, Bible character. God has, God spends much time with Moses and after the burning bush, You'll find that uh, uh, Moses, who, who, who was the one who had the law, God's law, given to the children of Israel? It was Moses. You remember, God, God told Moses to come up to Mount Sinai, and, and there, was some, there was some heavenly things happening on top of that mountain. And God was revealing himself to Moses, and God gives Moses the law. And he gives Moses the law for this purpose. He reveals himself And he reveals who he is through the law. The law was never meant for you to keep it and for you to be saved. Therefore, by no deeds of the law shall any flesh be justified. The law's purpose was for God to reveal himself through the law and for us to understand that we need God. That was God's purpose. Uh, And you can read about that in Galatians. The Bible says that uh, the law was our schoolmaster. It was to bring us to God. It was, to, it was for God to reveal himself and to say, you're a sinful people and you, you fall short of righteousness and, and you need me. That was God's purpose with the law and he gave it to Moses and Moses gave it to the people. And so Moses acts as this mediator between man and God. And he's given uh, information by God so he can take it to people so people can know who God is. And, 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 and don't get lost here. I'm going to get to the point here in a second. There's a point with all of this. But here's what we need to understand. God wants to reveal himself to you. But it's not on your terms. Amen. It's on God's terms. And God has made it very specific on how he's revealing himself to people. As you get uh, from Moses, uh, uh, let's look at a few verses with Moses. Uh, look at verse uh, Exodus chapter number 19. Exodus chapter number 19. And and verse number 9, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And so God reveals himself to Moses in a thick cloud. And yet again, we're finding more and more that the Bible says in Hebrews, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets. God has spoken to man in in many different ways. He he appeared to Abraham in a vision. He appeared to Moses by a burning bush. He appeared to, uh, here he appears to Moses again in a thick cloud. And as we go on, look at Exodus chapter number 24. Exodus chapter number 24 and verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and a commandment and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God. And so here you have not just Moses, but also Joshua. Go to Exodus chapter number 24. I'm sorry, Exodus chapter number 33. 
Moses takes Joshua up to the mountain and, and Moses and Joshua have, have uh, time with God. And then in Exodus chapter number 33, they set up a tent outside of the camp of Israel. And, and this tent is known as a place where you can go and you can meet with God. You can go and you can meet with God. And, and look at verse number 7, and Exodus 33, verse number 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Very clear. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. God reveals himself to Moses and talks to him, literally. And look at verse number 10. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And so here you have this transition from Moses to Joshua, where, where Moses is the one who's face to face with God. And then in, in, when it comes to Joshua, and we're not going to look at it, uh, but when you get to Joshua in Exodus, uh, the Lord appears, I'm sorry, in in Joshua, in the book of Joshua, you'll find the, the, the angel of the Lord reveals himself to Joshua and gives him the instruction uh, about how to uh, knock the walls down of Jericho. And that's the angel of the Lord. And then from, from that point on, there's very, very many, uh, after Moses, you'll find that God really finish, finishes revealing himself to mankind. Uh, he doesn't speak as much as he used to to mankind. We'll see that he talked uh, to Adam and Eve in the garden. We see that uh, with Enoch, he walked with God. We see with Abraham that the Lord came and spent time with him in his tent. And we see with, uh, with Isaac that the Lord appears unto Isaac. And we even see with Jacob that the Lord reveals himself to Jacob and wrestles with him and reveals to him dreams. And we see in Moses that Moses has face-to-face -face encounters with God. And you see that, that Moses is, takes the law from God. And then we find Joshua, who is the, who is the, uh, the, the, the successor of, uh, of Moses. And we find that really the only revelation of God God to Joshua is through an angel. And from that point forward, you don't see God revealing himself to man. There's instances here and there. And you'll find instances where, where man finds himself face to face with God. We think of Isaiah as he's transported into the throne room and he stands before God. And we'll find instances uh, like Daniel, when, when Daniel is, is praying by the river and God reveals himself, but through an angel. We'll also find the time where, where there was a hand writing on the wall. Right? And so there's these interesting uh, times. There's these interesting spiritual, supernatural ways in which God has revealed himself to man. And, 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 and then it all kind of stops. Where does it stop? In Malachi. We'll find that God, remember what it says in Hebrews, that God spake unto the fathers by the prophets. God starts to speak through prophets. He starts to speak through men that he sends on his behalf. He sends, uh, we think of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and God calls him uh, and he sends him to the nation of Israel to warn them. He sends Ezekiel, he sends Isaiah, he sends Micah, he sends Jonah to the, the, the nation of Nineveh. He sends uh, uh, Haggai, he sends Nehemiah, he sends all these different men. And, and through these men, he reveals his will to man. And when it gets to Malachi, it stops. And there's a 400 period, uh, there's a 400 year period between Malachi and who's the next person that God reveals himself through, but Jesus Christ. And there's 400 years between Malachi and Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, uh, one, that God who at sundry times spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us. I don't know about you. I, I get a little weirded out when people say, well, God spoke to me. 
not that I, I'm discrediting them. I, I don't want to discredit them. But I, I do have to step back and say, well, whenever you hear an instance of God speaking, and we use terms today, and they're kind of vague. We say, well, I feel like God is leading me. I feel like God is telling me. I feel like, and, and we use these terms, and they're good terms because God does lead you. But understand that God has spoken unto us in these last days by his son. And any revelation, any extra revelation that you get, if it's not in accordance with his son, then it's not revelation. And it's not biblical. Why? Because God spoke to us. He revealed to us in these last days through his son. And here's why that's important. I, I, I don't want to say this isn't God's final message. This wasn't God's final message. But it was his last known message to mankind. And what, what was that? What was his last message? Uh, uh, as a final message to mankind, God in his infinite love for mankind, he sends a man. All these other times, God sends a man to get a message across. He, he sends a man to, for man to know who he is. And in these last days, he sends the express image of God. He sends to him, not, not just another man. He sends to him, uh, not a vision. He doesn't send to mankind a burning bush. He doesn't reveal himself to mankind by a writing on the wall. He reveals himself through his very son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John uh, writes, as he writes the book of 1 John, he pens and he says, uh, and he talks about Jesus Christ, and he says, uh, 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 whom we have heard, whom we have seen, whom we have touched, whom we have handled, the word of life. And, and, and what I want to get across this morning is that God has revealed himself to you. He has revealed himself to you, not in a vision, not in some weird, obscure voice, not in some weird way, but God, in a literal way, sent his son to die for you so that you could know that God has one message for you is that he loves you and he wants you to repent and turn to him. God has revealed himself to you through his very son. And the Bible says that, 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 that we, man, and I talked about it earlier, that mankind is sinful. We are not taking steps towards God. We're taking steps away from God. And the more steps we take away from God, the less God is revealing himself to you. But God wants you to turn and and God wants you to turn towards him and start drawing nigh to him so that he can start drawing nigh to you and so that you can know him on a better level. We understand that in Romans chapter number 3, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin separates us from who God is and who God, God wants to have a fellowship with you. But because of your sin and because of my sin, we're taking steps away from God and we're going in the opposite direction and the Bible says in the Psalms that God sits upon his throne in heaven and he looks down on earth and he searches the world looking for somebody that seeks him. And the Bible says there is none. There's none that seek after the God. They've all gone aside. In Isaiah chapter number 53, the Bible says, all we like have sheep have gone astray. We're all turned aside to our own way. We, we, there's not a man in this world that is taking steps towards God in, in our flesh. We all just want to go away from God. And yet God is so loving and so compassionate that he, lo for, for God so loved the world that he gave, he revealed himself. He wants you to know who he is. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says the son of man came not to, uh, came not to uh, be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus is coming to the world to save sinners of whom I am in 
I am chief. What I want you to understand this morning, my friend, is God has revealed himself to you through his son. He wants you to understand that you are a sinner. You are lost. You are depraved. You are gone aside. You are headed towards a hell. And God said, I'm sending my son so that you can be given life, so that you can have life, so that you can be living again, so that you can come towards me and have a relationship with me. And yet we have chosen to go aside. God has revealed himself to you. My friend, this morning, here's the message. God has shown himself to you. Will you turn to him? God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to know who you are. God wants to have a constant communion with you and a fellowship through you. But it's only through his son. You can only know who God is through his son. And we must go through him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is through Jesus Christ and what he did for us on Calvary that gives us the ability to know who God is. And yet, and yet we're pleased with taking another step away from God. What we're pleased with turning aside. We're, 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 we're fine with going away from God. My friend, this morning, it is not God's fault that your life is so bad. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's my fault. It's mankind's fault. We just progressively keep taking steps away from God. God wants you to have life. God wants you to have it more abundantly. He wants you to know who he is. He wants you to take steps towards him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to know who he is. And yet we're content taking steps away from him. I think that's shame on us. I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about saved people. We're content with taking steps away. We're content with not knowing who he is. I, I didn't get saved to just live the rest of my life carefree. No, my friend, when I got saved, I wanted to know who God is. I, I don't want to just be saved for the sake of being saved. I want to be saved because I want to know who he is. I want to know the joy that comes with knowing who Jesus is. I want to know the, 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 the love and the peace that comes with knowing who God is, but it's only through his son. That's why you have all these other uh, 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 religions out here and they have all their rules that they uphold and they say, this is what you need to do in order to have a good life. You have, excuse me, you have the Jehovah Witnesses, you have the Mormons, you even have some Catholics who try and tell you this is how you can know who God is. But understand, every single one of them failed to mention that you can only know who God is through Jesus Christ. And they might say that, oh yeah, we believe in Jesus, but my friend, they do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Why? Because the Bible tells us we know that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. We know that it's not what we do. It's not based on anything, I want to know God more so I'm going to try harder. It's not about trying harder. It's about knowing who Jesus is. It's about knowing Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ? We say, uh, yeah, I know who He is. I know that I, I, I know the, 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 I know that he came and I, I know that he died for me. Well, good. Have you trusted in him? Have you put your faith in him? Have you said that Jesus is my all in all? I'm not trusting in my works. I'm not trusting in baptism. I'm not, I'm not collecting Jesus as another God that I can have. But, but it's Jesus or nothing. It's not about knowing the story. It's about knowing the Savior. Do you know the Savior? Hey, you can know the story. That's a good thing. Hey, the, you need to know the story. You need to know that Jesus came to die to set you free. You need to know that. Now, here's my question. Do you trust in it? Do you believe in it? 
Do you believe that, that, that you need? I'm not just saying want. You need the Savior. Do you know that? Do you know that life is not found anywhere else but by Jesus Christ? Do you know that? Do you know that truth cannot be found anywhere else? There is no institute of learning that can teach you the truth if Jesus is not there. But it's Jesus. Do you know that hope is not found in, in the politicians or hope is not found in, in any other man who, who, who you might reverence or give respect to? Hope is found in Jesus. That, that, that's what it's about. It's always been about Jesus. From the foundation of the world, he was slain. And, and, and Jesus, he, he, is, he is and was and is to come. He always will be. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's always been about Jesus Christ. Uh, you think about it. Uh, Jesus came and he said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. You think of Apollos and, and he was going through and he was publicly showing them by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. It's always been about about Jesus. The whole Old Testament, uh, every time God revealed himself to man, it was so for, for us to know that it was about Jesus Christ. You go through the scriptures and you'll find Jesus. You'll go through every chapter and every verse and every page. You'll find Jesus. You'll find that God had this master plan from the beginning of time that he would send his only begotten son into the world so that we might know God. That, that's the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, according to the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was going to come and die so that we might be free, so that we might be given life. He, he took our iniquity. He took all our sins. He took everything that separates you from God. He took everything that, that, that makes you want to go away from God. He took it all and he cast it into the deepest sea. And he says, now's the time for you to have a relationship with God. It's all been revealed to you, my friend. Thou art therefore inexcusable, O man. You have no excuse for why you have a poor relationship with God. You have none. You're as close to God as you want to be. God has revealed himself to mankind. There's been a 2,000 year gap between the last time God has revealed himself to man. God is not slack concerning his promises. But is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. For 2,000 years, there's been an open window for man to put their faith and trust in God because of what Jesus did for us. There needs not to be any new revelation. God has made it so clear. God has made it so simple to understand. And yet for 2,000 years, we see man keep taking more steps and steps away from God and gets farther away. We need to know who God is this morning. And I don't just say that as a token phrase of being a Christian. But I say we need to know who God is. We have to know who God is. It is vital for, for this church to thrive to know who God is. You can say, well, I think I know enough. My friend, you'll never know enough. The Bible talks in Ephesians about the depth and the height and the breadth and the length of God's love. You'll never understand it. We'll never be able to comprehend it. God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Our misconception of who God is is that we believe God is way lower than who he is. And Job said in the book of Job, he said, I believe that thou canst do everything. And a lot of us in here don't believe that. Man, oh, oh, that God would have people who would say, I believe that God can do everything. But you won't believe that if you're not trusting in his son. If you're not in your Bible, 
if you're not constantly seeking a relationship with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please. You got to have faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is what? That he is. That he always was. That he's always been. He's just been. We think it doesn't make sense. By faith, we believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Can it be said about you this morning that you're diligently seeking God? But say, I want to know who God is, and I'm, I'm looking for him. I'm searching for him. He's made himself known. He's made himself known to you. You can know who God is. It's a crying shame that we're content not knowing who God is. I, I'm not talking ill of any of you in here. It's the same for my case. And I get, I get so complacent. I get apathetic about who God is and I don't care about how he's revealed himself to me. That's the end of the, 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 end of the matter. We don't care. God revealed himself to you. He wants you to know who he is and we're content with not caring. My message, the, the, the message this morning is very clear. God revealed himself to you. Do you want to know him? You can know him. Just come to him. Just believe that he is. Let's stand. Everybody with their heads bowed, their eyes closed.